Hi, my name is Brian Capo, and welcome to this week's Ask Brian part of our weekly newsletter. Remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel, and if you get a chance, subscribe to our weekly newsletter, which you can find a link in the description below in the video description. Also, a link to ask a question if you want. So this week I got a pretty technical question about generalized method of moments and generalized estimating equations and that sort of thing. So the person in specific was asking about a paper where they were looking at homicide rates as they related to stand your ground laws. Um, so I'm going to talk about this in generality, but I'm going to use this the rough idea of this problem to frame it. Okay, so whenever, or not whenever, but often when we're modeling an outcome, we might assume some form of linearity. So we might, let's, and we often relate that to a so-called linear predictor. So the linear, some linear component of the outcome is related to say an intercept and let's say a regressor that we're interested in and some regressors that are kind of nuisance regressors. And if we're modeling a rate, we might have some sort of log offset or something like that. Okay, that's usually called the linear predictor. It might have, you know, 50 predictors in it. It might have two. Okay, these things are all things we know. The parameters beta naught, beta one, beta two are things we don't know and would like to know. And they're the things that relate our predictors to our outcome. Okay, but we haven't related this to our outcome yet. So what we usually, the way this is related to our outcome is we say it's the expected or you know, population average value of our outcome. Okay, or if it's a rate, we might say that the log of the number of events right, follows the linear, the expected number of events follows the linear predictor. Or if it's binary data, we might say something like the logit, which is the log x over 1 minus x, um, natural log, uh, is what I mean in all these cases. Expect a value of a binary y, y that takes value 0, 1, might be follow the linear predictor. And we like linearity because it makes it easy to fit, it makes uh, coefficients that are easy to interpret, and in fact, if we take our linear assumptions on the first moment, this is the first moment because it's just the expected value of y, not say expected value of yi squared or cubed or whatever. It's the first moment because it's just the expected value of y. The model on the first moment often gives us enough plus some sampling assumptions to get coefficients like beta i, beta 1 hat that really actually converge to some, in some sense, a true value of beta 1 assuming we've specified that moment right. We don't need full Gaussian assumptions or et cetera, right? Um, however, we don't just want something that's consistent. We don't just want something that converges. We want it to actually to have some inference, right? like a confidence interval or hypothesis test. Okay, so to do that, there's been a series of work starting you know, with White and the Huber uh, and, and Huber uh, the Huber White papers, uh, White's papers were very influential. They were in the econometrics literature. There's a related literature that came out later called the Generalized Method of Moments. That's uh, Lars Peter Hansen, if I'm recalling correctly. I think he won a Nobel Prize for that. Uh, and then in, in my department, there's uh, work that we like a lot called Generalized Estimating Equations. It was worked on at about the same time as Generalized Method of Moments. It's by Scott Zeger and Kung Yi Liang, kind of the two two big professors here. Uh, Kung Yi left a few years ago to be a president of the university. Scott is still here. He's sort of one of the luminaries around this department and around the university in general. So uh, what these techniques all have in common is that you have some sort of obvious estimator that you want. So as an example, an estimator that we might like if, if let's just suppose we've simplified the setting where the there's one x and it's just all constant. You have an estimator that you might like, like the average of the y's if you just wanted to estimate their mean. Okay, And the average is a really good estimator and it's probably still continues to be really good even if things like the errors are autocorrelated. The errors around the mean are sort of autocorrelated. Auto but what's problematic is that unless we have IID data, the calculating the variance of y gets kind of hard and doing inference gets kind of hard. So basically what these techniques have done is they've taken this general regression setting where we have a regression model on the first moment. They coupled it with a, uh, you need a kind of general variance estimate that you know will kind of work out just fine 
even if you've misspecified the variance. And then you, you use the so-called sandwich variance estimate. So, and this is kind of a weird name. And I'm not, you don't really need to understand the math, but I'll just show you why they call it a sandwich variance estimate. If you take something like the variance of A times Z, where Z is random and A is a, is a matrix, right? This works out to be A variance of Z, A transpose. So all I'm trying to tell you here is that they're calling the matrix on the outside A to be the bread and the variance of Z part in the middle to be the meat. So that's the sandwich or if you're like me, that maybe the middle part's tofu or something like that. At any rate, um, the sandwich variance estimate basically boils down to applying that formula, in this case, to where you have kind of a really conservative sort of variance estimate, and then you use it in conjunction with your good estimate of your first moment thing that you want, okay, and then you get inferences that are correct, at least asymptotically, with some assumptions. Now, those assumptions can be kind of e a little bit easier, like in the case of generalized estimating equations, the assumptions they were tending to look at were the kind where the number of subjects went to infinity. So you had some misspecification of variances because there's uh, correlations within a subject. But still, you still have some kind of independence, collection of independent things going to infinity because you have, you're assuming that the number of subjects goes to infinity, well, the number of correlated measurements within a subject stays kind of finite. So that's the kind of easier asymptotics. The harder asymptotics comes where the number of correlated measurements is going to infinity and the you know, number of subjects or independent measurements is finite. However, you can still do the same sorts of things, and that's what they're, the, some of the work that they were pointing to in this kind of relied on those sorts of arguments as well. So in either case, what this work is trying to do is it's trying to get at um, robustness to having to fully specify the distribution in a problem. You only specify things about the first moment, and you make some conservative assumptions about the second moment, and you get inferences that are asymptotically correct in some sense of the word asymptotic. Okay, so the whole point is robustness. In this case, robustness to misspecification of the variance. So they might say you might have something like heteroscedastic variances, or autocorrelated variances, and that's what they're doing in this paper. And I think it's a pretty reasonable thing to do. It's a pretty reasonable thing in their case to be concerned with. Um, but this isn't by any means the only way to address this problem, right? There's kind of generalizations, the bootstrap, um, and there's, there's some other solutions. So you might try to model your way to this problem, actually model the autocorrelated errors. So in this case, you're saying that's kind of a nuisance. I don't want to model it. I don't want to be bothered with trying to figure out what's the, all the intricacies of the time series going on. I just want to estimate my first order model and I, the rest of it's kind of a nuisance, so I'm gonna use a robust procedure and that's the technique they're taking. It's, it's conservative and it, and it doesn't require all the intricacies of specifying a full model, so it's, it's not bad. This is not a bad thing to do. Okay, so hopefully that demystifies this a little bit. We don't have any classes that currently go over this stuff. A little bit in my linear models class, you can get some of this information, but that's a pretty advanced class, but uh, we cover it a little bit. And I think as I continue on with that linear models class on Coursera, I'll probably cover uh, some of the Huber-White estimation and some of the asymptotics in detail. Uh, and then at some point, I think we'll have a longitudinal data class on Coursera where we'll, we'll cover some of this stuff in a more uh, overviewish way. Okay, so if you get a chance, subscribe, and um, subscribe both to the newsletter and to the YouTube channel, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Keep those questions coming.